Amanda and Patty, welcome to the podcast. How are you? Great. Thank you for the invitation. Yes, thank yeah. you. No, absolutely. And shout out to Sherry, one of my previous guests, for creating this connection for us. Yes, love her. She's amazing. She's my rock star. Yeah, absolutely. And you, you grew up with Sherry. Yeah, we right? went to high school together. Yeah, what was she like? Uh, a little crazy. <laughs> but she's just has, she's always had the biggest heart. Yeah. Yeah, she's always had this like really this entrepreneurial fire and this influence inside of her. It's it's yes. amazing to see her. She's almost unstoppable. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we have some important things to talk about today, especially really discussing this big issue, which is, you know, eating disorders and, and some of the misconceptions of. So let's start with a little bit of your story. So first off, how did you two meet? Sherry. Through Sherry yes. also. <laughs> Sherry she's a hyper connector. We yeah. just met yesterday. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, wow. You just met yesterday. Okay. Yes. Right. Wow. She, she came to my organization with the willingness to tell her story. And so we have uh, somebody else who did a podcast interview with her. And then she was on the news last night, CBS. Gotcha. Okay. Well, well, Patty, let's start with your entrepreneurial story. Give us a little bit more about your background. Well, I started out in the jewelry business when I was in high school. The first job I think all kids have to have is fast food. Mm -hmm. So I got that off of the way. And then I ended up in uh, retail jewelry part-time and just kind of kept on going, never got out. Moved from retail jewelry to appraising to brokering, and now I buy and sell pre-owned as well as create new jewelry for people. So it's kind of full circle. I'm back in the transactional business again. Wow. And, and how did you become passionate about this particular topic? Well, unfortunately, I um, had a death in my family. My niece, Kelly, was taken from us 10 years ago this summer oh. from anorexia. Wow. Our family traveled a dramatically different path than what you have traveled. We knew that Kelly was ill. We knew that she had anorexia. She herself was not in denial, but she did not like to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And she was never hospitalized. So our family was very ignorant about the degree of severity. And one day, Kelly went to sleep and did not wake up. What were some of the early symptoms that you started to recognize? Like, was there a plan of action once you started to notice things? Like, what did that look like? Yes. Um, Kelly went to college and she did not want to gain that famous freshman 15 mm -hmm. so she started exercising and eating right and it all began in a healthily enough way then she began to obsess about it she couldn't exercise enough she couldn't restrict enough mm -hmm. one semester she came home for a visit and my sister her mother was horrified with how she looked she looked quite skeletal so they began a plan of action but a lot had already taken place. By the time she was 26, she was graduating from college, she was married, she had a master's degree, she was um, basically living the life. So everybody thought she had pretty much conquered this demon. And yet, one day, as I said, she went to bed and just did not wake up the next day. She had heart failure. So the way that we can understand it is that so much damage had already been done during the time that she was ill, that even after she had apparently regained her health, there was some internal damage that we didn't understand. And how long ago was this? 10 years in August of wow. this year. Well, it sounds like you have really taken action to help sort of educate the public about this and also have aligned your entrepreneurial background with what you're doing now. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Yes, it's taken quite a while for us to even get the organization started because of the deep grief that my family was in. They couldn't really get their brain around it. They couldn't have a conversation without it being quite emotional and tear-filled. So one day, I just decided that I wanted to do something for Kelly. When she was alive, we always tried to do something, but we didn't really know what it was. So I came up with the idea that I would create this foundation, and of course that's how we named it, Something for Kelly. If we couldn't help her during her lifetime, at least we could do something for her legacy. What I decided I wanted to do was to create a piece of jewelry, or a line of jewelry, if you will, that would be representative to people as to how they are touched by this disease. Mm -hmm. So in collaboration with a designer, we created four different styles of jewelry. One, if you yourself are fighting this disease. Another, if you have successfully recovered from it and are on top of the world about it. One, if you are supporting somebody but you don't personally struggle with it yourself. 
And then the final design is people like myself who had somebody taken from their lives. Mm. And the, the name of the jewelry line is Kelly's Circle. And it, it's just what it looks like. It's a form of jewelry that is in a circle. And various models are designed to communicate non-verbally that you are somehow touched by the disease of an eating disorder. The, the disease is very shame-filled. It's a very secretive disease, and people are not comfortable talking about it most of the time when they're in the throes of the disease. So the concept behind it is to allow somebody who is in the middle of the disease to be able to non-verbally communicate that they're fighting with it among themselves, but with other people, they can say to their family members, I'm having a bad day today because the design in the necklace has an interchangeable component. If you're having a reasonably good day, you wear one piece. If you're having kind of a tough day and you want to talk ab- and you don't necessarily want to talk about it, or maybe you do, but you want to at least communicate it, then you wear this other piece of jewelry, this other component in it. And my, my hope is that this will reach out to people with all forms of mental illness, but specifically eating disorders, and that one day this is going to be the pink ribbon of mental illness. So people can recognize that somebody has been touched, and Amanda is wearing one of our pieces today. Wow. And, and you leverage the funds to further the mission how? Education and research. Right now we do not have solid standards for treatment protocol. Mm-hmm. And we would like to advance the standards. We would like to advance research. And we're working very hard in that direction. We're collaborating with the Academy for Eating Disorders in that area. Gotcha. Okay. Well, Amanda and Patty, you guys have joined forces here because you have a a very similar kind of mission and purpose. and, And you have a personal experience with this disorder. So let's learn a little bit about that. Um, Where should we start? I mean... As early, like as early as six years old, I remember starting to restrict. Six years old? Six years old. What were the thoughts that you were experiencing? It's, I can like so distinctively remember sitting at the, like the lunch table with my friends and seeing them not having chocolate milk and there's not croutons on their food. And so I gave those two things up at six years old because they were beautiful. They were skinny. And I mean, looking back, it's like, wow, I was six years old. Who was, who thinks like that at six? And it just continued on. And then middle school it got worse and then high school was up and down and then college came and the freshman 15 was thrown in your face and I was like I'll show you and dropped 40 pounds you know my first semester and it just continued down and then eventually I turned to drugs to help like not eat and take my appetite away and have the energy to keep going even though I was not fueling my body and Eventually, it landed me with some kidney damage and some heart damage, and then I finally sought help when I was about, I think, 27 or 28. I can't remember. Was there a particular kind of event that forced you to go seek the help? Um, In 2014, after the kidney issues that I had, um, I did get help for the drugs. Mm -hmm. For some reason, it was easier to go to treatment for that. Um, And then I was sober, but I was still so active in the eating disorder, and I was seeing an outside therapist, and... She was like, I can't see you if you don't go get help. So she gave me resources, and I checked in that same week to a treatment center. But So what is the healing, the recovery process like from this? It's hard. Um, it's learning to, like, you know, with drugs, you take them out of your environment. With eating, you can't really do that. You need food to survive. So it's learning how to be okay with what you're eating, be able to sit with it, um, not try to figure out how to burn those calories off or go purge or Mm -hmm. just get the calories out somehow. It's a a struggle. So for anyone tuning in right now that might actually have been struggling with an eating disorder, like what are some actionable steps that they should be taking now to get on that path to recovery? Reaching out. Eating disorders thrive in secrecy, and there's a lot of shame with it. Um, I say definitely reaching out. There are resources, um, even like just a therapist or a dietitian, Mm -hmm. if you're not wanting to go to treatment. Like they can, you can have your own little outside team that can help get you on the path to recovery and aid in that process. So really, is seeking professional help. That's like number one. Oh yes. Gotcha. Definitely, and definitely having a good community around you. So let's start the education process with with our listeners then. Tell us more about the actual gravity of this issue. 
Thank you for asking that. Most people do not understand how severe it was or how severe it can be. Mm -hmm. And I point the finger at myself as well, so I'm not trying to make anybody feel uncomfortable because they're ignorant about how severe this is. But somebody dies from an eating disorder every 62 minutes. This disease has the highest mortality rate of any mental illness. Wow. And the suicide rate is extremely high inside of this disease as well. So the suicide rate seems to get, in the general population, a certain amount of recognition, but inside of the world of eating disorders, the amount of self-harm and attempted suicide is very high. People are not aware of the severity and the comorbidity. So for an example, Amanda is very brave today to share her story that, and it is not uncommon for people to have both drug addiction and an eating disorder, and then the complications around that make treatment even more challenging. Definitely more challenging. You could speak to that way better than I could because, again, as I say, my family experienced a severe loss, but it was nowhere near the way your journey was. Right. So I, when I was in drug treatment, it helped get me sober, but they didn't know how to handle the eating disorder, so I ended up getting medically discharged. So I'm out, you know, brand new in recovery for being sober and struggling immensely with an eating disorder. And the same thing with like going to eating disorder treatment. They don't really know that they don't deal with the drug side of it. So it's, it was really hard for me to find some place that could help with both issues and be in recovery for both at the same time. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. And, and you mentioned also that there's a lot of misconceptions about this, like individuals with eating disorders are misunderstood. And some people are just like, well, just, you know, eat a hamburger or whatever. So what, what do you want to say to that? Well, I'm, I know you have a lot to say about it, so I'll just start and then you can go from there. It's very mean-spirited and it comes from ignorance and misunderstanding and people are not aware how hurtful that is. You see somebody, for an example, if you heard that somebody had cancer, you wouldn't make fun of them and say that it was their own doing. So somebody who is fighting with an eating disorder did not choose to have an eating disorder. This is not a lifestyle. This is not merely a vanity play or trying to get attention. It, there's a very complex web of issues that can come together. There's a genetic component sometimes. There's an environmental component sometimes. There are a variety of issues. It's not just a singular blame the parents, blame social media, you know, blame the uh, kids at school. It's really not a blame-filled discussion. It really doesn't belong there. My goal is to educate people who are so misinformed that they think that this is a choice because it's really not. It, people would not choose to have this situation. No. <clears throat> yeah, and a lot of, um, I know when I was very active in my eating disorder, like, or if I was coming off, like, some recovery time and then I relapsed into it and people would ask questions or be like, you don't look like you have an eating disorder or they'd be on the flip side. They'd go, I wish I had an eating disorder. And I'm like, you don't wish this miserable existence. Like, so they're just uneducated. And I think that's the key and educate, like getting that education out there, letting people know the truth about like what an eating disorder is really like. It's not, vanity it's not for attention and I mean it's just a dark hole of emptiness that you go down and sorry I'm nervous no that's that's okay <laughs> that's okay so it, it seems like we address that if you are experiencing this the first step you need to do is go seek professional help now let's say someone is close to you in your life who's experiencing this but either doesn't know they have an issue or they don't want to publicize this, what do you do as the loved one to help that person? Thank you for asking that question. My niece was ill when she was in high school and we did not know it until after she died. Hmm. And then the way we found it out is that her siblings and her high school friends came forward and said, we were aware, but we didn't want for her to get into trouble or we didn't want to out her, rat her out. Mm -hmm. 
I want people to understand you are not ratting somebody out. You might be saving their life. So if you know somebody is purging, if you know somebody is struggling, if you know somebody is binge eating or hiding the behavior because it is very, it is shame filled. People are, f feel bad when they're doing this behavior. They don't, they know that what they're doing is not healthy. They know that what they're doing is not strong for their body. So if a family member is showing signs where they're isolating, where um, my niece's brother heard her purging and he didn't know what to do, so he kept quiet mm. and he loves her dearly. And I would just say, do something, reach out, let them know that, that you care. Amanda, you could probably respond better how somebody would react. I know that, that Kelly was not in denial. But she didn't want to talk about it, and she didn't want to deal with it in a way that was healthy. So, for an example, she did seek help from a therapist occasionally, and she did have a nutritionist in her life. But it was something that because she was such a perfectionist and it was such a difficult subject, it was not something that she would easily have conversation about. And so even when she was married, that was a point of friction inside of her marriage where she would start to lose some weight and her husband would encourage her and she would say things like, I'm really stressed right now, I'll get back on the program next week or something such as that. So I think you could probably answer how the person who's struggling, or yourself personally, obviously you're not speaking for everybody that's right. ever had an eating disorder. Well for me, um, a lot of being consumed by the eating disorder, um, I didn't have to deal with the emotions in my life or the bad things that had happened and it was a way to numb myself so and then speaking up about it made me feel like I was weak asking for help made me feel weak and really that's not the case at all it's strength to speak up and ask for help but um yeah if I saw somebody going through it I mean I would just I don't know let them know I'm there for them and I don't know. It's like, it's not, I don't want people to feel ashamed that they're struggling with this. That's probably one of the biggest things that we could get to come out of this time in which we're living. This next week is going to be Eating Disorder Awareness Week. Mm -hmm. and, and bringing it out of the shadow, bringing it out of the darkness, bringing it out of the guilt and shame-filled space. If we could start with that and people that are family members start the conversation and people who are struggling start the conversation. And I think your point is really important. Asking for help is a sign of strength and that should be repeated because it's, right. you, you would not have anybody not want their community around them if they had cancer. You would not want everybody to ask for help if they were trying to get sober. You would want the community to support. So we, we have to have this, come out of the shadows and, and have people realize, one, it's real, it's severe, it takes about six to seven years for a lot of people to recover, and it's about that same window of time where people die from it. Mm -hmm. So the intersection of the two is incredibly dangerous. I think that's an important space to know as well. Yes, and it's not, I mean, there's just so many different types of eating disorders, it's, there's not one look to it, too. Mm -hmm. So just because you're not underweight doesn't mean you're not suffering in your life isn't on the line. And I think that's important to get out too. That is critically important. I think everybody has an opinion of what somebody who has anorexia looks like. They have seen enough images on social media or the news and they think that that person has to be bone showing skeleton thin. And you bring up a very important point in that you can have a variety, you can have normal weight and be anorexic because sometimes people do start to diet and restrict calories in a very severe way and they can go from being marginally heavy or overweight depending upon what term you want to use to dramatic weight reduction and so their BMI would not indicate that they were anorexic but in fact they might be having an eating disorder. Okay. So you cannot you cannot look at somebody and say you don't have an eating disorder. That's not a, a fair assessment of how to gauge. Right. And my uh, when I first got sober, I went from being that was I got down to 98 pounds between in full blown addiction and eating disorder, 
And then my first year sober, I gained close to a hundred pounds. I would, you know, I didn't know how to cope, um, being sober and then having food and having to eat. And, um, and then I went from almost 200 pounds back down to 120 in less than like six months. So that's where my heart damage came in. That's where my kidney issues came back in. So people, I just want people to know that just because you're at whatever weight doesn't mean you're not struggling and that your life isn't in jeopardy and that you, it's okay to ask for help. When we looked at Kelly, we did not think that she was still struggling with anorexia. We thought that her, her weight looked normal for her size and height. And yet the next day we found her dead. So you cannot assume by what you see that somebody is healthy. That's a critical point yes, as well. I agree. What do you think is the, is the symptom that does take place but not a lot of people talk about or maybe should look for if they suspect something? Well, I know that some things are that people become more isolated. Is that? Definitely. Yeah. Amanda's nodding her head. I, I know that if, um, if somebody has lost a significant amount of weight, they might start wearing baggy clothes to hide the fact that they have lost so much weight. Interesting. Definitely something I did. There you go. So refused to buy clothes on my size. They were always like three times bigger. Um, one thing that a lot of commonality is that people have almost a, a perfectionist nature about them. They're, they're constantly trying to strive to get everything perfect. right and mm -hmm. perfect. Um, people who struggle often have a very high IQ. Um, so this, this is some of the characteristics of people who might be susceptible to an eating disorder. Uh, were there any other behavioral issues that... Like if I'm in a room, like um, when I went to treatment for the drug part and I was in the cafeteria that you eat in, you can sit in there and you can watch people's behaviors if you know what to look for, obviously, but people pushing food around or hiding food in their pockets or chugging water, which is something I would do. Um, stuff like that like and they get people like I know I got weird around food situations and it caused me a lot of anxiety to where I would stop going out to eat and I would have to like come up with an excuse to leave a restaurant immediately after I ate so I could drive down the road to the gas station and purge um so yeah running to the bathroom afterwards drinking a lot of water just and sitting at the table being right yeah and I, I think also if you're a parent of a minor I think really checking when they come home and say they ate lunch at school or mm -hmm. really being sure that they are eating their food at home. And it is not anything that you need to be shaming them about because that's not going to help the situation any. It's sometimes encouraging them and sitting with them to have a full, healthy meal. One thing that just jumped into my mind, which is a little bit off the subject of this right now, but something that I remember learning very recently or within the last year and a half. When people are anorexic, they are starving themselves. Everybody understands that. So they're starving their organs, and one of our organs is our brain. So if you get to the point where you are literally starving your brain along with all of the rest of your organs, your kidneys, your heart, you cannot physically make a decision to feed yourself. And that just blew my mind when I fully fathomed that. Because that goes right to the heart of people that say, what's wrong with you? Why can't you just eat a hamburger? Why don't you just get a sandwich and get over it? That's why in some of the treatment programs, I think that when professionals sit down with patients, they actually help them to decide what to eat and the quantity to eat. Help me with this, Manda. I know that when I went to treatment the last time, I call it like a brain fog. I was so malnourished that I couldn't even think straight. Even performing like or speaking sentences was almost impossible at some points. Um, so my team, like for the first two or three weeks I was there, they picked my menu for me because I couldn't even circle choices on there. Like to me, you have certain requirements, like you need grains, proteins, fats. I couldn't even sit there and pick out the right amount to equal the amount I needed. So they definitely did, you know, 
take over and do that for me until I was getting more nutrition in and I could actually think a lot better and clearer, which was very beneficial. So I, I think that goes right to the heart of people who, who genuinely do not understand. Another subject that, that my mind, I'm sorry, I'm hopping around. I'm no, staying on okay. eating disorders, sure. but I'm thinking of things that I know are very important and relevant. One, one aspect, I think, of eating disorders, especially as it relates to minors, is how critical it is for both parents to be involved mm -hmm. with the work for the kid. Because we're still a little bit stereotyped in our country where traditionally moms have done a lot of the doctor's visits, the dentist's visits, the, the checkups, etc. cetera. If, if dads would be aware just how severe this is and that this is not just a thing and that especially because they don't understand it and they may not believe that it is a legitimate diagnosis, they may just think this is a phase and the kid's going to pass through it. Mm. Both parents really should be fully engaged in the importance of the family, the, the community, excuse me, the family involvement, especially in minors, has been proven to be the most effective. Mm. So we really do encourage siblings and parents to be all in as it relates. And I think the sooner that everybody embraces how important this is, the success rate will go up for treatment of minors as well. Gotcha. Yes, and I know like for me, I didn't, re when I finally got treatment, I was older um, and I didn't have family involvement because um, my situation was crazy. But my friends would come in because you would have family therapy sessions and I would have friends come in and it's a great way to talk about like things you shouldn't say around me that might trigger me, you know, or please, I know you think I look healthy, but please don't make that comment because that makes me feel like I'm fat. Just so I think that's very helpful getting like my sister involved and definitely aided in my recovery. Would you share more, more about what you shouldn't say to somebody? Cause I think that's as important as how to encourage people, because as you said, some people are really well-intentioned, but right. as with us, in our family, we didn't know what to say to Kelly. We didn't know if we should offer her help. We didn't understand. And again, I'm not blaming me or my family. I just, it was 10 years ago and time has changed and more information is out and share what, what not to say, what doesn't help. Um, any like comments on your appearance definitely doesn't help. Like for me, um, if you're going out to eat and they're like, wow, you finished your plate. Mm. That's just like heartbreaking for, for me to hear sometimes. Even now, when I'm 14 months into this recovery journey, and it's still hard. Um, or when people will, you're talking about it, and people will be like, oh, well, you were this, you had this eating disorder because you don't look this way, which is harmful. They make a diagnosis based on how you appear. Yeah. Okay. Appearance, I guess that's really what it comes down to a lot. We make a lot of assumptions based on what we see, and the point is that this is a, a mental illness that manifests medically very severely of course and no more than you could look at somebody and decide that they have a particular kind of a cancer mm. then you could decide what kind of a diagnosis of an eating disorder that you have right i keep coming back to cancer because i know that in in my lifetime people didn't talk about breast cancer when i was a kid and now it's very common to talk about it everybody understands that it's something we need to talk about and we need to run for the cure. And, and that's what I want to do with eating disorders. I want to make, you know, alcoholism. In my lifetime, people didn't talk about alcoholism. I mean, I'm not 100, but, you know, I'm not 20. <laughs> and, and so in my lifetime, I want eating disorders to be better understood. I want them to be talked about. And I want them to be such that people who have an eating disorder feel comfortable asking for help. Right. I know a few people now who have told me that they were more willing to talk about their drug addiction than their eating disorder. Mm. And I find that to be something, Amanda's over here nodding, I find that to be something we just have to turn around. Right. We I have, agree. Yeah, people wouldn't make fun of somebody that had an addiction. People wouldn't say that you chose this route, but somehow or another it's okay to blame people for an eating disorder because they think they're being vain. Mm. And that's... That's just got to stop, and it starts with people who are advocates such as myself, or people who have recovered such as Amanda, who kind of help correct that misperception. We don't need to come back at them with the same 
angry, judgmental energy, but we absolutely need to lovingly explain to them that it's not a choice. I you, agree. you wouldn't choose it. No. Oh, no. So close us out with some final thoughts then. You have a very specific agenda, which is to educate the public about this topic, to gain awareness. What would you want to say as some final thoughts? Amanda, we'll start with you. I'll put you on the spot. Um, And, you know, speak to the individual who who is listening and might be struggling with this and may not want to share it with anyone publicly. Like, what what do you want to say there? um, If you are struggling, find just that one person. Even if it's you message them on social media or send them a text and let them know you're struggling. Just let somebody know because that's how you get on the journey to get the help you need. Because you got to let somebody know. Thank you, Amanda. I guess this is a kind of a nice partnership because I personally did not have an eating disorder. So Mm -hmm. you're the one who can speak to that. I come from the side of the family where... If I were talking to my person of 20 years ago, because Kelly died 10 years ago, and probably 20 years ago I could have made more of an impact, I would say to the family members, you're not outing them. You are not protecting them. You need to understand how severe this is, and you need to reach out to their parent and help them understand how severe this can be, Mm -hmm. and that it's, it's deadly. It's the real thing. It's very deadly. And come at them in a loving way, and not a way that makes them feel even more ashamed than they're already feeling. Right. Absolutely. And it's not their fault, and it's not mom's fault. She's not a helicopter mom. I mean, don't lay blame on the person. Don't lay. It's not a blame filled or shame filled. That goes into. Yeah, that's that's the rap for me. Disorder. Yeah. Well, well, how do we connect with you? How do we support? The mission, the nonprofit, tell us all this. Thank you. Somethingforkelly.org has a website, and our line of jewelry, Kelly Circle, is there. We support other non-for-profits through the sale of the jewelry. We advocate for research, and we are actually going to be in New York at the Academy for Eating Disorders Conference next month, and we're working very diligently with them to establish standards for treatment and advance the cause of research. So somethingforkelly.org, and we would love to have you as part of the family. Thank you, Patty. And Amanda, are you anywhere on social that uh, we could connect with you? And Yes, I am on Facebook and Instagram. Okay. Yes. And we'll make sure to have both of uh, your information in the show notes so we can connect with you and support you as well. So thank you both very much for c- coming on the podcast and, and really shedding some light on this very important topic. Thank you for having yes, us. Yes, thank you. So. And everyone else, thank you all for turning in t- tuning into another episode of the Pathways to Success. As always, make sure to subscribe, comment, and share. And we'll see you next time on the next episode of the Pathways to Success.